Final level check, check one, two, beginning shortly, final level check. Good afternoon. We're going to try to bring in a few more chairs for folks. It's a great turnout for a Friday afternoon. Uh, when the staff suggested we do this lecture on a Friday afternoon, uh, I, I ex expressed my skepticism. I wasn't one to go to any lectures on a Friday afternoon when I was a student. Um, but they said, no, people will come out. People came out. So welcome. Um, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. It's a pleasure to uh, have you all with us today. Um, uh, just a few things to say, and then I'll introduce um, a student who will introduce our speaker. But I want to take a, a moment um, for, for a few reasons uh, with just a few comments. Um, it's been a relatively tough uh, semester for the center. We um, uh, lost a few folks uh, who were um, friends of the center um, uh, this semester, some for good reasons, some for less good reasons. Uh, two long-term staff members of mine, Jen Smith and Soren Greffenstadt, you know them well. They both retired for wonderful reasons. Soren had her uh, fourth child, a uh, little baby porter, and she wanted to stay home so she could be with him. And then uh, uh, Soren uh, uh, had her second uh, child, uh, John Carl, uh, class of 2045. Um, so. <laughs> They're both doing very well, but they had been with me and helped build the center. Um, um, so we miss them. And, I, and since this is the last uh, public event of the semester and they both uh, retired this semester, I just wanted to publicly acknowledge them and their really great contribution, um, especially uh, all they did for our students. We lost another staff member. Or, sounds like you passed away. You didn't pass away. Uh, Zane uh, Marbury, who many of you know, um, great young kid. Uh, Christmas Eve was diagnosed with cancer, um, and a pretty aggressive form of cancer. Um, so, um, and, you know, really out of the blue. We were uh, working out one week, and he was, you know, in the hospital the next week. So, Zane's a fighter, and he's fighting. I was hoping he'd be here today. He's uh, getting some really uh, specialized treatment at the Uni University of Chicago. Um, so, Zane, if you're, if you're watching, um, we're hoping he'll be back with us uh, uh, next fall. Uh, but we've missed him a lot, and um, 
you know, keep, keep your prayers um, uh, for Zane. You know, I think he's 25 years old, so that's a, that's a rough thing to be going through. So um, just please uh, keep Zane uh, in, your, in your prayers. And then um, one of our friends uh, and a benefactor of the center, uh, Bob Griffin, uh, passed away uh, unexpectedly just a, a few weeks ago. In fact, his wake is today and his funeral will be tomorrow. And it, it, hits, it hits home because he's going to be with us here today. Um, I met him at events like this. He just, he, you would recognize him. He, you know, uh, Bob and his brother Rich, um, um, they love Notre Dame and they, they love the students and they love seeing students um, interact with our speakers. Uh, in fact, you know, they gave a little, little bit, they actually gave a lot to the center, uh, in part to bring in speakers like Professor Yu to meet with undergraduates. And they were all about undergraduates. And so my heart's a little heavy. Um, because, um, you know, I was, I was planning to speak, uh, spend the weekend with Bob. So Bob Griffin, class of 57, uh, he's Navy ROTC. So please keep Bob and his, his younger brother, uh, Rich, in, uh, in that family. And we had a, a private mass for them uh, this afternoon. But keep the Griffin brothers and uh, uh, Bob's family in your prayers as well. The difficulties we have have... Um, also brought many blessings. I mean, that always seems, seems to happen. So there's a couple staff members around here. I don't know, they're probably getting chairs. Where is, is Debbie around? Debbie, where are you? Debbie O'Malley here, and Don just walked in. He's getting chairs. So we have a staff of five that became a staff of two. Um, I don't count me because I'm useless for these things. Um, <laughs> Don and Debbie have been doing the work of five people all semester. Uh, Harv came in and joined us halfway through, and Harv's been a great blessing, um, sort of a uh, 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 serenity in the midst of chaos. Uh, so it's been great to bring Harv in. But really, Don and Debbie have carried the center and carried me uh, for the last, um, last four months. So I just want to say uh, thank you to, to Don and Debbie especially. So uh, thanks for everything we do. Okay, the business at hand. Um, as you might imagine, this is going to be a long lecture. Uh, we'll take a break for dinner, uh, and we'll see if Professor Yu can finish by the kickoff tomorrow. No. We, ha we have a uh, tradition here at the program where our, uh, one of our undergraduate fellows introduces our speaker. So, uh, Kiera, Kiera, where are you? You're a sophomore, con studies minor? PLS major, about to become a con studies minor, and she'll introduce <laughs> Professor Yu. Welcome. John Yu is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Professor Yu's new book is The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court with Robert Delahunty. His many other books include Defender in Chief, Trump's Fight for Presidential Power, Point of Attack, Preventative War, International Law, and Global Welfare, and Crisis and Command, A History of Executive Power from George Washington to George Bush. In addition to publishing more than 100 academic articles, Professor Yu regularly contributes to the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and National Review, among others. Professor Yu has served in all three branches of government, including in the U.S. Department of Justice, where he worked on national security and terrorism issues after the 9-11 attacks. Professor Yu graduated from Yale Law School and summa cum laude from Harvard College. Thank you for joining us, Professor Yu. Yes? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to come join you. I know, as you all know, that I'm really just the pregame entertainment for something which is called a, what blue and gold game is it called, Phil? It, which was described to me as a, 
inter inter team scrimmage for Notre Dame football, but which I was assured would be far better than any Cal Bears football game in the last <laughs> 25 years. Uh, I have no ground on which to disagree uh, with Phil. Although I will note, Aaron Rodgers and Jared Goff went to Berkeley. I, I let me tell a small, quick story about football, if you don't mind. So when you're the junior, when you're a junior professor, I joined the faculty at Berkeley in 1993. Uh, you work on Saturdays, right? Because you want to get tenure. So I'm in the office every Saturday. My office was across, it still is across the street from the football stadium at Berkeley. And I didn't know until about five or six years there that they fired a cannon when we scored a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> this was news to me until I heard the first one when Aaron Rodgers appeared on the, sta on the field. So sad but true. Um, um, so it's really great to be here with Phil, a very old friend of mine, and I think you're lucky to have him as one of the great uh, scholars in the country on uh, religious liberties and the Constitution. But I also think it's a wonderful thing he's running here, this citizenship for a, uh, a Center for Citizenship and Constitutional uh, Government. Um, you know, in the country, we're now having a fight over IVF, but it sounds like if you want to have a kid, all you got to do is work for Phil Munoz. And they start coming at four, five, six kids, a staff member. This is incredible. We could solve the problems in Arkansas and Alabama, just send them up here to Notre Dame to work. I'm also uh, just want to say, just uh, in all seriousness, one thing I've been spending the day at campus today, and it's been wonderful to see, uh, and I think Notre Dame really is a good, great example for the rest of us of how to handle the current unrest on campus we're all seeing today. Uh, in my own school, Berkeley, uh, protesters about the Gaza-Israeli war disrupted a dinner that my dean was having for graduating students at their request. Uh, and it went, unfortunately, uh, viral. I'm worried, uh, you saw what happened at Columbia University yesterday. You've seen what's been going on around the country. Uh, and what impressed me about what I've seen so far in Notre Dame is that, of course, students must have uh, a free speech right to express their political views of the issues of the day. That's part of our job at universities is to encourage and show our students how to meaningfully participate in public affairs. But I worry if that protest, legitimate as it is, starts to interfere with the mission of the university, which is to educate. Um, we always make choices uh, when we run a university about speech. Uh, Sadly or not, Professor Munoz and I get to decide what is taught in our classes in the course room. We get to decide what's a good view and not a good view. I, I encourage all the students to share whatever their views are, but I also have to give them a grade at the end of the semester. Right? That is, right? We're not running a complete free speech enterprise at the university because our primary mission is to educate students. And so I come from a university, uh, the University of California from Berkeley, that is a little different than Notre Dame. Uh, our university has been struck by protests since the Vietnam War. In fact, some of you may know the Vietnam War protests started uh, at Berkeley and then went nationwide. Um, so we have our share of protests, but sometimes I worry the protests go too far. And so I hope, and I saw what I've seen in Notre Dame so far is a good balance between legitimate free speech rights, but also allowing the mission of the university to continue because that's why we're all brought here together on a day like this. A day where we may all agree or disagree, but at least we're going to do it, I hope, with, uh, with an environment of civility, with respect for each other and each other's views. Uh, that said, it is so wonderful to get a chance to leave the People's Republic of Berkeley <laughs> <laughs> and, and, visit, and visit the United States of America. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so my talk today is going to be about uh, Trump's legal problems. And it is without regard to what you think about President Trump as a person, and it's without regard to what you think about what happened on January 6th and how much he should be held responsible. The question really is, how should we as a country and how should we with our institutions handle this problem? I think both sides of this are acting in unprecedented ways. Certainly what happened on January 6th and the days leading up to it were unprecedented. Right? President Trump refused to accept the election results. He tried to persuade his vice president to pause 
if not overturn the electoral vote count. And then he gave a fiery speech on the ellipse, which now that's this is part of the factual arguments or not. How much did it cause the march on the Capitol, the riots, the effort to interfere and stop the electoral count? However, I would say the response to that also is unprecedented. Uh, and as someone who's a law professor, what I see is the use of the law and what is commonly called quote unquote lawfare. The use of the law to achieve political goals. And it's not just that we could pretend law has no political goals. Of course, a lot of litigation, a lot of uh, law has politics to it. Um, for example, I would say look at uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade just a few years ago in the Dobbs case. That was a political objective, but it was also executed through the use of the law. I would say look at the legalization of gay marriage on the other side of things, also a political objective that was achieved through the law. But what worries me about the use of prosecutions in particular, this kind of lawfare we're seeing, is trying to oust from public life what, an area that used to be governed by I would say use weird words like common sense. You probably don't hear that much anymore. Reasonableness. Uh, I know F Phil likes the word prudence, although I don't know what prudence is. But he says prudence. statesmanship, wisdom, right? We used to restrain ourselves from pressing the maximum to the maximum what we could do with the law, what we could do under constitutional authority. And I think that's what worries me actually the most about these prosecutions that I'm about to discuss with you, is that in the past, and here's where we never prosecuted former presidents before. I'm not saying that former presidents never did anything worth prosecuting. Just read Robert Caro's biography of Lyndon Johnson if you want a four book indictment of the kind of person Lyndon Johnson was. If you want to indict people for being bad characters who'd been president, I'm sure we could have kept a whole suite at the Justice Department busy. But as a matter of restraint, as a matter of what we thought was good judgment, we would let former presidents ride off into the sunset. We let them retire and so on. Now that's not what Donald Trump's doing either, right? Because not only is he a former president, but we are also using prosecution against someone who is going to be one of the candidates for the presidency of the two major political parties. That we also haven't done before. Although, if there are any law students here, I know there are one or two footnotes to that, as there are for anything any lawyer says. But in general, we have never used prosecution to try to push out someone who was actually a major political party candidate for the presidency. We used to solve these problems through politics or through statesmanship. But now I think we're living in an era where we are using prosecution. We're using the full limits of what the legal system allows us to carry out, I think, programs or policies or agendas that we used to solve between ourselves without resort to the law. I can't think of a better example of that than what's been happening with Donald Trump. I think I personally, my view is at the very least, people, if they want to hold him accountable for January 6th, if they want to make a statement of what they think about Donald Trump, the best place, the most obvious place is the ballot box in November. But what you're seeing here is a replacement of the ballot box with I would call it the witness box, right? You have different prosecutors, some at the city level in the Manhattan DA, some in the county level, Fannie Willis in Fulton County, Georgia, and some at the federal level, the special counsel, right? special counsel Smith, trying to use prosecution, I think, to push Donald Trump out of the national election. I don't have any problem if in the end, as a country, we think that Donald Trump is responsible for January 6th and should right, receive some kind of sanction. What could be the greater sanction than choosing not to elect him in November? So let me uh, talk a little bit about each trial, and then I want to be conscious of the time and open up to uh, questions. I, I'm going to try to reserve at least a half hour uh, for questions. Oh, by the way, since I'm a law professor, if there are no questions, I will randomly call on people. <laughs> and, you know, especially the people here for the 
football scrimmage, I can tell who you are. Uh, I assume you haven't done the reading. So <laughs> I, you're the ones I usually call on first. Um, but I'd like to leave about 30, 30 minutes for questions. But let me preface it by just a, a few uh, themes. First is uh, how, and I think America is actually kind of is really seeing this, really, I, I wouldn't say for the first time, but really on display in a way it hadn't been before, is the power of the prosecutor. Right? Uh, you are starting to see now, I think, the enormous discretion the prosecutor has to pick and choose cases. Uh, the, maybe the greatest federal prosecutor of the modern age was Robert Jackson, who eventually became attorney general under FDR, became a great Supreme Court justice. He is one of the greatest writers ever to be on the Supreme Court. He famously said of the Supreme Court, uh, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible because we are final. He's also the one who said uh, this, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. And he's just one of the great writers in Supreme Court history. He gave, I think, the, the greatest speech in American history about prosecutors when he was attorney general. It is still a speech that's given to Justice Department attorneys to read and to think about. It's considered one of the core documents at the Justice Department about how you do your job. And in this job, he said, uh, the prosecutor has more power over the life, liberty, and reputation of any single individual in America than anyone else in the country. And why is that? He said, because a lawyer, has, a prosecutor has so much discretion to pick and choose cases, to decide what's in the public interest, to look at evidence that they can pick anybody out of the crowd and decide to make them the cause, to right, organize the view of the public against that person to try them in the public eye, even before they get to the courtroom. They can destroy life, liberty, and reputation. And that's even before you get to the courtroom. And then he said, in the courtroom, a prosecutor can eventually persuade a jury to put someone in jail, to take away their liberty, to take away their money, to destroy their reputation. And he said, what are the limits on the power of the prosecutor? And it used to be some of the things I was talking about common sense, wisdom, statesmanship. They're not limits that are in the law, that are judges are gonna give, judges are gonna give prosecutors a lot of discretion. And so the one thing that Justice Jackson was worried about more than any other was that prosecutors would use that vast authority to target people just because they were unpopular, just because the prosecutor didn't like them, just because they had the wrong views he said, as quote here, the greatest threat of the abuse of prosecutorial power, he said, lies in singling out some person because he dislikes them or he wants to embarrass them. Some of you who know uh, Russian history, you may remember uh, the head of the Soviet secret police, I believe, once said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Right? That's the thing Justice Jackson was worried about. We picked the person first and then we use the law and focus it on them second, when it should be the other way around. What we have instead is a president gets elected, an attorney general is appointed based on a program, an agenda they set out to the American people, certain priorities, and then they carry them out without regard to who the individual is in their identity, but whether they fit that program to protect the public in the national interest. So ask yourselves as I go through these cases, is that standard being met in the Trump cases? Second uh, theme I wanna ha ask you to think about as I go through the cases is uh, law uh, is very much a retrospective enterprise, right? When you think about a criminal trial, it's a historical enterprise. We wanna know who did this, what happened in the past. But you should realize everything we're doing today is gonna have an enormous effect on the future. Think about what's happening now. How will it affect the presidency? How will it affect the separation of powers? How will it affect our constitutional order? Um, do you worry about opening up the possibility now that presidents will prosecute their predecessors as a matter of course, as does happen in other countries? Do you worry that presidents 
will start to worry about being sued when they have to make the toughest decisions for our country. I mean, we're, we all see this problem with the police today. Right? There are arguments about, are the police becoming too risk averse because they're worried about their legal liabilities when they have to make life and death decisions on, right, on the spur of the moment? Police officers, are, police, at least, in, well, I, I don't blame them for not wanting to sign up, but in San Francisco and Oakland, we are having a hard time getting even minimum number of police officers to sign up for duty now. And I think part of that is if you were a police, if you were someone who could serve or hold another, another job, would you want to take a job where everything you do could be the subject of a lawsuit against you in the future? My worry is that we will start to have presidents who become the fancy just risk averse. Right? Do you want to have presidents who think like insurance agents? No insult to any insurance, anybody in the insurance business. You perform a very valuable role. I just wish you did it a little cheaper. Um, right? The, do you want presidents who are always worried about potential legal liability when they have to make some of the hardest decisions? That's the thing I think we should be worried about. And then lastly, uh, again, and this is my return to this theme, and I'm, I'm glad some of you, I know some of you, I met with you this morning, are Tocqueville fellows. Right? And you remember, uh, for whom you're named, Tocqueville, you know, sort of effete French nobleman, takes a little vacation in the United States and somehow comes back with a book, Democracy in America, which describes things about our country and society which are still true today and which escape sometimes the greatest sociologists in American history return to Tocqueville to get insights. I don't know how he did it. I'm very suspicious of the French as a general matter, <laughs> as we all should be in this country, in our great country. But um, how in the world did Tocqueville have such great insights about us just from a quick well, a few months tour. One thing he said, I'm sure the Tocqueville fellows know this, he said, in the United States, he said, because of the position of lawyers in our country, because of the absence of an aristocracy, by the way, for those of you going to law school, he says the lawyers are actually the aristocracy in the United States. He said, because of the importance of law and the absence of aristocracy, every important political question in the United States eventually becomes a legal question, and eventually Americans expect the courts to solve important political disputes. He was not saying this as a good thing. And I would say, I would tell you, I agree with Tocqueville. It's not necessarily a good thing that we look to the courts to settle everything. We already asked them to solve the most fundamental social questions in our society. Are we gonna ask them to start delving even more deeply into elections to decide who's a fit candidate or not? Do we so not trust ourselves as an electorate that we want the judiciary to a lot of Americans probably would say, yes, that would be great. Uh, if you look at opinion polls, uh, the federal courts are far more trusted than Congress and the presidency these days to solve our problems. But I think that raises serious problems for us as a question of self-government. Do we want the law? Do we want, and the law will always encourage you to drive your powers to the greatest limit. Do we want that to replace what used to be governed by political self-restraint and wisdom. So let me just go through some of the Trump trials, describe them. I'm sure, actually, I'm sure I don't have to describe them that much, but let me uh, uh, raise some of the flaws, I think, with them and why they actually illustrate some of these concerns we should think about. The one we're looking at right now, obviously, is a case uh, brought by Alvin Bragg, the DA in Manhattan, against Donald Trump. No, no, don't wait, don't wait, 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 I haven't started yet. <laughs> um, and as you saw, uh, jury selection just finished uh, today. Now, this is a case involving, I, I, I told Phil, you know, I know Notre Dame's such an ethical, moral place. Do I really have to talk about porn stars and hush money? And he said, yes, you must. <laughs> he said, because I can't do my classes, so I bring in people from the outside to do it. <laughs> so in this case, you may remember the facts are that Donald Trump allegedly had a romantic encounter, see what good euphemisms I can use, <laughs> with uh, a young lady who um, makes her career in unusual video presentations. Um, and allegedly, uh, President Trump, while he was a candidate, wanted to, uh, in exchange for a non-disclosure agreement 
which is quite common in the business world, pay her some of money. He allegedly paid the money to his lawyer, Michael Cohen, who then paid the young lady and uh, accounted for this as legal fees. I guess, you know, the, the Trump ledger already has hush money payoffs. The column was so full that there was no space at the bottom of the line of the ledger. They did create a new one, legal fees. Actually, that question actually goes to whether this is really illegal or not. So the problem is that Alvin Bragg can't charge Donald Trump for the bookkeeping misrepresentations because they happened too long ago. They're beyond what we call the statute of limitations. Plus, they're misdemeanors. They don't result in jail time. Usually they result in a fine. So what Albert Bragg says is this is actually upgraded to a felony, and a felony is where you get convicted of a serious crime for which you can go to jail that has a statute of limitations that's longer because the bookkeeping was really done to cover up a greater crime. That's a crime. That, that is true under New York law. But the problem is President Trump hasn't been convicted of any other crime. And so Alvin Bragg has to say that other greater crime for which Donald Trump is guilty, that he was covering up, is violating the federal campaign laws. When Donald Trump tried to pay off the young lady in exchange for the non-disclosure agreement, Alvin Bragg says, he was really making a campaign contribution to himself. Because by keeping her quiet, he was helping his campaign and the likelihood that he would become president. And that's the, the case in chief. The problem with this is, I mean, there are several problems. Actually, to me, uh, put aside the facts, whether they're true or not. We don't know. We'll have to see at trial what can be proven by the prosecution or not. Uh, I do have to say this, the key witness in the case is going to be Michael Cohen, who has been already convicted of a felony and then has committed perjury and has switched his story twice. Uh, this is not when I was a justice who I would be leading off the trial with. I would actually pay him a lot of money to take a vacation to France while the trial was going on <laughs> if I was still at the Justice Department. I was like, I do not know why we're leading off with a character like this as the prime witness. But the main, there's a legal problem with the case is uh, these payments are not a violation of campaign law. In fact, if Donald Trump had paid her and recorded it as a campaign expenditure and charged his campaign for it, he would have been committing a crime then. The point of campaign law is you can't spend money on from campaign coffers to pay for things that you would normally spend money on even if you weren't running for election. Like, for example, you can't spend campaign money on just buying clothes or going to the dry cleaner or paying your mortgage or your car payments. That's just regular life. You would have spent that anyway. Campaign contributions can only go for things that are necessary to run the campaign. And actually, I think it's quite clear that this would not have been, this is not a campaign contribution. And the reason why, and this is the greater legal problem, is that federal law is only supposed to be enforced by the federal government. And states and cities, they enforce their own law. Alan Brank's not allowed to try to prove a federal crime against Donald Trump. The Justice Department looked at this, and they decided not to bring a case. The Federal Elections Commission looked at this, and they chose not to bring a case. They did not think that there was sufficient evidence to prove any violation of federal law. Now, some of you may say, oh, why not? Why can't cities and states prosecute federal law? And the reason why is because, again, remember I said you elect a president. That president appoints an attorney general. They give you their agenda for law enforcement. That's part of why we elect presidents, is their agenda for law enforcement. If city and state prosecutors could run around the country enforcing federal laws they want, they're effectively outside the control of a president. We would have no idea, no way, I'm sorry, no way of controlling what they did with federal prosecution. It actually undermines the principle of executive accountability and the, uh, and the provision in the Constitution that says it's the president who is required to faithfully execute the law. Um, actually, for those of you really following things, uh, you might notice this echoes the debate involving Texas versus Biden in the border. 
and the Biden administration is making this very same argument against Texas. They are saying Texas is not allowed to enforce federal immigration law. Only the United States government can enforce federal immigration law. They are right. Uh, under current Supreme Court doctrine, states and cities are not allowed to enforce federal law. So that's up to the president and Congress and, who, and federal judges. Interestingly, that argument there means that Alvin Bragg should not be able to proceed with his prosecution in New York City. I'm going to uh, quickly go over the Fannie Willis uh, Georgia trial against President Trump. Uh, one is, uh, when I first started watching it, I thought I was watching a criminal trial, but instead it turned into a reality TV show, you know, Real Prosecutors of Atlanta. <laughs> Right? And we have no idea what's going to happen because they're still sorting out where, you know, whether one prosecutor was sleeping in a house nearby the other prosecutor. And the, so it was, I mean, as a prosecutor, that was one of the most embarrassing things I have ever seen. And you know, well, this is another thing Justice Jackson said is actually when you think about it, uh, prosecution and law enforcement depends on public confidence in the police and prosecutors in the courts. Because believe it or not, prosecutors don't roam the country looking for crimes. We actually depend almost entirely for the identification of crimes to investigate on the public. Usually most of the things we investigated came from the public saying this happened or I saw that or this person harmed me. What if the public didn't have faith in the police and prosecutors? That would seriously interfere with the ability to enforce the law. What if members of the public said I'm not going to be a witness? I'm not going to cooperate with the government. Right? I'm not going to show up to court when, the, when I'm called. If you have that kind of lack of public integrity in the, in the uh, prosecution service, I would worry that the public will start to lose faith in the justice system. And I worry that's what's going on in Atlanta. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I'm really not sure how the, what's going to happen in the last episode. There's always a surprise. So... <laughs> But just one point I'll make about it is I do have, again, a constitutional issue with characterizing a re-election campaign, which is, if you think about the core of the First Amendment, is to protect political speech, particularly speech necessary for our ability to run elections. I worry if a, when a prosecutor says, whatever you think about him, that Donald Trump's re-election campaign, the whole thing is an organized crime racket. That's what she says in her papers. I have a lot of difficulty with that, and I think President Trump actually has a very strong free speech argument that he's going to be able to make on appeal should this case ever get to trial. And also, let me also pause and pass over the uh, classified documents case. Uh, oddly, I think that is, Phil has excellent timing, I have to say. Even better now. <laughs> uh, the, classified documents case, oddly, is the one that would be the easiest one for the United States to win against Trump because they could just put aside the question of classified documents and just ask, did President Trump try to obstruct FBI investigators? Uh, this, uh, of course, as you know, has raised claims of selective prosecution from President Trump because he says, look, these other guys like Biden have classified documents in their house too. Why am I being singled out when there have there, no former president or vice president has ever been prosecuted for mishandling classified information? And then, of course, he always resorts to the easy out for any Republican, which is, and what about Hillary? <laughs> right? <laughs> so he says, and Hillary and her server and all those classified emails, what about them? Um, the one thing about and this is why Justice Jackson was saying it's important for prosecutors and the Justice Department to limit itself is because courts will not hear those kinds of claims. Uh, believe it or not, it is not a defense to a, tri a criminal charge to say you should be going after that person too. That, the judges will not allow that. And the Supreme Court generally would not allow that as an attack on a prosecution that there's some other person who's more guilty than you. Right? So that's why it's even more important that prosecutors exercise self-restraint. But anyway, I don't think that trial is going to uh, actually take place before the election. So I'll put that one to one side and focus on the one trial I think is worthy and is important. And that would be the January 6th trial, right? The trial by the special counsel, Jack Smith, against Donald Trump for his alleged involvement in the January 6th attack on the Capitol and the effort to prevent the counting of the electoral votes. 
first, I would say if you're going to go after a president, former president, for the first time, and you're essentially going to accuse him of insurrection and sedition, you must have a watertight case, I think. You want to come with all your ducks in a row. The last thing you want to do is to throw out untried theories of prosecution. You want to make up new kinds of charges that have never been brought before because you are setting an important precedent. If you're going to go after a former president, you damn well better win. That's what I'd say if I was attorney general. You know, if I was Merrick Garland, I was like, Jack Smith, you damn well better win and don't make stuff up and be cautious and conservative. Not conservative and liberal conservative, but conservative and don't take risks because you're setting the precedent of the first trial of a former president and the first trial of a major candidate during the election. So if you're going to cross that Rubicon, it better be in a case where you've got everything nailed down. And that is the problem I have with this. Again, put aside what you think happened on January 6th, whether you, how responsible you think Donald Trump is. What bothers me about this is that the prosecutor here did not charge Donald Trump with insurrection or sedition. In fact, for those of you who are following the uh, disqualification case that came out of Colorado, that would have solved that whole problem. Because if Jack Smith had charged Donald Trump with insurrection, and if he did win the case before the election, Donald Trump would have been stricken from the ballot under the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court said the federal government has not tried to execute this insurrection provision at all. I do not understand why the prosecution decided not to charge Trump if it believes what it says about him for insurrection. President Biden is out there. He called President Trump an insurrectionist in public. He's the head of the executive branch. He is Merrick Garland's boss. He, can, he has a constitutional authority to direct Merrick Garland to bring those charges if he really believes them. And if the accounting of the facts that the prosecution believe are true, let's see it put out in court, in open court, where it can be tested and witnessed by the public. Instead, the special counsel has charged President Trump with three crimes which just I don't think fit the facts. The first one is committing fraud on the United States. Committing fraud on the United States is usually charged against uh, defense contractors who overcharge, Medicare providers who overcharge. The Supreme Court has actually said in a series of decisions over the last 10 years is that prosecutors are not to use this charge to charge political candidates or political officials where no money or property has been stolen. I don't see how January 6 meets that requirement. And I think a lot of commentators say this is a very weak charge because the Supreme Court has been so clear in quashing earlier Justice Department efforts to use this charge against politicians. The second charge is obstructing a congressional process, really a congressional investigation. Uh, this one also has serious problems with it. What is the congressional proceeding where President Trump actually obstructed the production of evidence? This was a provision that was passed after the 2000-2001 accounting scandals. Uh, it's called Sarbanes-Oxley. There were several large companies that failed, and there were accounting problems in those companies. This was passed primarily to get at defendants who were being asked to testify in Congress and were destroying documents, or destroying evidence. Now, the interesting thing about this, this charge is that the Supreme Court just heard arguments this week about the uses of this charge against other January 6 defendants. And I think it's 50-50, uh, maybe even worse, as to whether the Supreme Court's going to allow this charge to be used at all. It could well say this charge just does not fit any of the January 6 prosecutions and must be dropped. If that's the case, then there's only one charge left for the special counsel. And I think this is actually one that fits least well, which is he has charged Donald Trump with uh, essentially invalidating the voting rights of every single American. He's saying by trying to change the electoral vote, he has tried to disregard the will of the people as expressed in the 2020 election. 
and that is a violation of all of their voting rights. That law is usually used, I think for good reason, to go after people who try to stop people from getting to the ballot, trying to stop people who interfere right, with the taking of the election, who try to disrupt the election, with things that happen in the South from Reconstruction all the way through to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We're all familiar with the evils of that period and the federal law, this kind of federal law is aimed at stopping that. How did President Trump actually interfere with the rights of all of those voters to actually cast their vote? Instead, what he tried to do was, he did try to use violence and overthrow the government with the army. I mean, that would be an obvious coup. What he tried to do was persuade the vice president to use this power under the Constitution, whether it exists or not, who knows, we don't have any Supreme Court cases about it, to not count electoral votes from some states. That's a serious constitutional issue. But I don't think it's a deprivation of voting rights of individual voters. If it is, then consider in past elections, like 2016, for example, or 2000, for example, when people tried to get electors not to vote for Donald Trump or not to vote for George W. Bush. Did those people commit voter right violations when they tried to say, don't vote for them, for the good of country, change your electoral vote to somebody else? I don't think so. I don't think anybody at the time thought so. So I want to uh, be sensitive to the time and leave a half hour for questions. So let me wrap up there. But let me just end by saying, again, uh, what we should think about is not just punishing people for the past. What we always have to think about when we use the law or the Constitution for something is we are setting incentives for the future. And what worries me is that we are going to make the criminal justice system a permanent feature of the way we choose to run elections, the way we choose to transition power from one party to another. And I am very worried that this would be a serious blow in replacing good judgment, common sense, prudence with the extremes of people like me, lawyers, law professors, judges. I don't think that would be healthy for citizenship and constitutional government. Right? So thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. We have a tradition here at the program. Uh, we'll have uh, any undergraduates? <laughs> I know some of you uh, uh, seniors uh, didn't quite finish in four years. But, uh, Gabby? Let's see. Get our lights back on. The right. Chinese are doing anything to stop me from speaking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do we have another microphone out here? Just this one? Go ahead, Gabby, stand up and tell us who you are. Um, I'm Gabrielle. I'm a senior here, going to law school next year. My condolences. <laughs> we can't wait to have you. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier um, this morning that you said that uh, in the case with Texas, with the Texas border and the Biden administration, that the Biden administration has made a political statement by choosing not to enforce immigration laws that are already in place. So they're making, they're saying something by essentially saying nothing. And analogously, if the attorney general has the ability to make a similar kind of statement by not choosing to prosecute a sort of case, and as political objectives are increasingly achieved through the law, are you worried that there will be this new political power coming from the attorney general choosing not to prosecute, prosecute um, federal crimes, and how can the states avoid this if they don't have the jurisdiction to prosecute these crimes themselves? That's a great question. Gabby. Um, so uh, remember I said the prosecutors choose which pe cases to bring when they enforce federal law. Uh, Justice Jackson said, and actually every president knows, every prosecutor knows, you can't prosecute everybody for every crime that's committed all the time. Right? Otherwise we would throw 80% uh, of California, well, that's not a bad idea, 80% of Californians <laughs> in jail for violating the traffic laws. Right? We all speed. Nobody drives under the speed limit in California. Um, many people don't drive without the assistance of marijuana and other ex <laughs> helpful accelerants too, but we'll talk about that another time. 
So uh, the government has to pick and choose which cases to bring. And when the prosecutors do hope they pick the cases where the violation of the law is the worst, where it's most in the public interest, maybe this is a good example, and where the evidence is the best. This is generally what the Justice Department thinks about when it picks a crime. The problem is, what if the president or the attorney general says, I will bring zero cases, not just 10% or 20% or 50%, I will bring no cases involving violations of this federal law. That's a serious problem because that essentially gives a president a veto over that law, essentially. He says, if I'm not going to enforce it, then it's almost like the law was never passed. And it's unlike the real presidential veto, it can't be overridden. Right? Congress can't pass another law to say, no, you really have to prosecute. Uh, and this brings actually Montesquieu to mind because what Montesquieu said was uh, tyranny begins when the executive and the legislative branches are combined. So he also, you don't want Congress prosecuting people. Uh, you, Congress can give a lot of money for prosecutors. It can right, give more resources to the Border Patrol. But what Congress can't do is actually conduct prosecutions. So this is a serious problem. What happens if the executive branch chooses not to bring any cases at all, just doesn't enforce federal law. The Supreme Court has actually never really said what happens in that case. Uh, there was an effort to bring a case involving immigration law about that back in uh, 2020. Um, and the Supreme Court basically sent it back and didn't make a firm decision on this. So that's, that's just one issue. That doesn't involve Texas or the states at all. It's just how do you, what do you do if a president doesn't want to enforce a certain kind of crime? The second issue then is what is the role of the state? And so in the, uh, for those of you who weren't there, most of you weren't there, I was barely there because it was 6 a.m. California time, but I think I was there. And this morning when we met, we were talking about the border dispute between Texas and the Biden administration. And if you, for those of you who don't know, uh, Texas has argued that it has the right to use military force itself on the southern border, has put up barbed wire along parts of the border, and put the Texas National Guard, right, called it up and deployed it along the border. And uh, Texas says because the federal government is not enforcing immigration law, the state has a right. Now, notice that's very similar to the argument I was making about the problems with the Bragg prosecution. Right? Can states decide? We want federal law enforced a certain way. Right now, the Supreme Court, I think, would say no. I think there's a case from 10 years ago where Arizona actually did something very similar to what Texas is doing now. The Supreme Court struck down Arizona. as well as a case called Arizona versus United States. And for this exact same reason, they said states can't enforce immigration law because that deprives the president under the faithful execution of the law clause of the ability to have a federal agenda, to make federal nationwide decisions about the enforcement of federal law. So I think right now, as the law stands, Texas uh, should lose. Now, to one more wrinkle about it, uh, I think you mentioned this earlier, is Texas then says, but this is different because there are so many aliens crossing the border, three and a half million a year, that the invasion clause is triggered. There is a small clause in the Constitution. It is so obscure about it that I think I was the first law professor to write about it 30 years ago, when no one cared about this that says states cannot engage in war except when they are actually invaded right, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. So this is a kind of a right of a state to engage in self-defense. The question is, does the movement of three million people across the border constitute an invasion? Is it an imminent danger of the kind the founders had in mind? I would say no. I don't think this is an invasion. I don't, this is not a military force. They're not working on behalf of a nation or a group that's at war with the United States. I think it's still right, immigration in the traditional sense. But this, I think what Texas ultimately is trying to do is to go to the Supreme Court again and see if they can get Arizona overruled. Um, one thing I told the students also is we don't really know much about what the founders thought about immigration and the federal and state balance. We have just a, very little uh, scholarly work, very little evidence. We have some, but not a lot. Uh, the Supreme Court has observed, has said this. Um, the federal government's authority over immigration is not mentioned by the Supreme Court until 1870, 1880, 1883, 84 in the Chinese Exclusion Act cases. 
Uh, and in fact, there the Supreme Court says immigration is not even mentioned in the Constitution. It comes from an almost extra constitutional source that all nations must have. And so I could see maybe Texas, their objective really is to trigger reconsideration of this at the Supreme Court and maybe argue for a broader role for states. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ella? Uh, hi, thank you for being here. I'm Ella, I'm a senior. I'm also going to law school in the fall. Are you really? Um, the two, are you going to the same school? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're like very I'm emphatic about that. Oh, good, good um, for you. But uh, I was curious about something that you mentioned at the beginning of your speech before you got into the specific litigation. So you talked about the obvious issue with integrating criminal prosecution into the election process. But then you also said that there's a problem with uh, attorney generals, you know, promising to enforce the laws and protect the, the nation and then um, not doing that or doing that based on the specific person, mm -hmm. which seems to me to necessitate the prosecution of presidents should they actually have violated the law or there's reason to believe that. So how do we find the threshold between when it's actually proper to prosecute a president and when we should use yeah. something like restraint to yeah. do that instead. That's a great question. I have to say, um, I don't agree with the view that presidents are immune from prosecution, which is going to be argued by at the Supreme Court by uh, President Trump and the special counsel next Thursday, I think, next week, last, last argument of the year. Uh, and the reason for that is, I think, if you look at the constitutional text in the Federalist Papers closely, they seem to me to anticipate former presidents and any former office holder could be prosecuted under federal criminal law for things they did as president. Uh, for example, the reason for this is the impeachment clause, actually. Uh, the impeachment clause, uh, the founders wanted to make clear, is not criminal. It's just the way you remove someone from office. And they say, if they do something and you remove them from office and they do something criminal, then you prosecute them after they leave office. So that, to me, implies, yes, they don't think there's an immunity. But that's really different than when is the right time to bring a prosecution? And so our system, until <coughs> President Trump thought the public interest was best served by basically never prosecuting former presidents. The only president who in our time, modern time, was under this threat was Richard Nixon. Right? He, wa he was uh, under investigation by the special counsel in the Watergate case. President Ford gave him a pardon against all prosecutions. But he, you know, he was somebody He's the only person, I think, who we really had to think hard about whether to prosecute. Um, and I think the reason, again, maybe it's best, I would say maybe it's best never to prosecute them no matter what they did because of the future possibility that you are going to interfere with the way presidents should think about decisions in the future. I, I having seen from three branches now the way you know, the presidency in operation, I think our country would be harmed if we had presidents who they're thinking about the right thing to do and they have to calculate whether they could be prosecuted. So for example, I thought the way we withdrew from Afghanistan was a terrible disaster. But I wouldn't want President Biden to be worried about, oh God, if I order this drone strike or if I withdraw in this way, is the Justice Department going to prosecute me someday? Right? Just even having to pause and think of that might delay decisions that have to be taken as quickly as possible. That's not to say presidents don't make mistakes. Presidents make lots of mistakes. I'm actually interested whether they make mistakes at a higher rate than the regular population. But they make a lot of mistakes. And the question is, do we want to correct the mistakes by punishing them through the criminal justice system? Or do we correct mistakes some other way? Or sometimes in others, like we accept mistakes and their harms because the, co the benefits of right, executive action are still superior. Uh, so that's. That's how I think about it. I would just, so you may disagree and say, oh, there should be some cases we should prosecute. That, that's certainly possible constitutionally. Then I still would argue you should have a high bar uh, before you choose to do that. And no president has ever hit that bar, at least if you look at the tradition, our tradition. Yeah. I'm gonna, Ella, who works for the center too, I'm going to have you uh, take that microphone. And why don't we open it up to fifth year seniors? There's a lot of fifth-year fifth seniors uh, in here. Decade seniors. <laughs> <laughs> There's an age discrimination <laughs> going on. You, you addressed the question I was going to ask because the Supreme Court's going to deal with the immunity issue. Yeah. I have the concern that 
th these prosecutions are setting a precedent that any president after their uh, term is going to be prosecuted. And the Afghan decision is a good one. Those 10 uh, soldiers who passed away because of it, those families could bring litigation. And if the president doesn't have immunity over those kind of decisions, uh, let me let me pause there first. Pause you there and uh, clarify. So presidents have absolute immunity from those kinds of lawsuits for money. What they don't have immunity from is prosecution by the criminal. justice. Yeah, criminal. Yeah. And actually, there's also I think a reasonable claim to be made that they should have some kind of immunity from states and cities. It's the federal government. If they're going to prosecute presidents, I think it really should be the federal government because if you have states and cities doing it, then and this is something the Supreme Court. Uh, commented on in its disqualification decision in Colorado is then you're opening up the possibility of states and cities right, retaliating each other. So what if, why doesn't this mean a DA in Texas could now charge President Biden for bribery, for you know, influence peddling with Hunter Biden? May not be true at all, who knows? But what's stopping him from bringing the case now if we start to say, Right, states and localities can just start prosecuting presidents. Sitting presidents would be no different than ex-presidents because none of them have a federal immunity defense otherwise. So I think, so that's one thing. But I do think that the federal government has the constitutional right to prosecute former presidents. The question is how do we use that, how should the Justice Department, how should future presidents use that discretion? So think about President Ford. Yeah. The easiest thing for President Ford to do if he wanted to get reelected was prosecute Nixon. I think what he did was for the best cycle of relitigating the past, settling scores. We want the presidents to start fresh and handle our problems we have now. Look how much time we're spending now already no, on enormous <laughs> on amount Trump. of time and money. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, I hope you eventually get your degree. <laughs> <laughs> If you pay full rate, we'll be happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, please introduce yourself, Dave. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Dale Hunt. I'm an alumnus from a half a century ago. <laughs> and I apologize. I wasn't trying to disrupt your talk by leaning against the light control. That is but... not the remotely worst thing that people have done to disrupt my talk. <laughs> <I see. laughs> well, well, thank you again. And, uh, Leaving aside your premise that these prosecutions are a substitute for the political process, I'd like to ask you something a little less controversial about the seating of jurors. Oh, yeah, how sure. How we're supposed to, though we have strong feelings, a lot of us, you know, how we're supposed to put those aside and consider yeah. the law and the evidence and, you know, come to a fair decision. Have you had a lot of experience with that or your views, even if you haven't? Uh, so I haven't myself ever gotten on a jury. I've really tried, and um, I always get knocked out when they ask you, how many judges do you know? And I was like, do you, so I, I always go, do you include the Supreme Court in that? And they're like, you can leave now. <laughs> Actually, Phil would have more of those than I would. Uh, Phil's never going to get on a jury. I really want to get on a jury because I want to see what happens in the jury room, which we really have, in fact, we're not supposed to know as lawyers in the courts. Uh, so that's, I've always really, I've really wanted to go on a jury, I've never been able to. Um, but the seating of juries, so this is the voir dire process we've just watched happen. One thing that's interesting about these Trump trials is that they are putting on display for the American people to see just how regular criminal justice is administered in the country. And I'm glad they're seeing that rather than thinking it was the OJ trial, which was by one of the most bizarre trials, you know, I've seen, where for uh, many months, I could go around the country, and if I put on a beard, people thought I was Judge Ito, and I was sitting on the trial. <laughs> people actually said that to me. I was, I, I, this is not a, I'm not going to actually tell the story. I'll get in trouble. But anyway, <laughs> I think a lot of people from that time drew their impressions about how the criminal justice system worked from the OJ trial. Now, with the Trump trials, they're going to see how a courtroom trial works. And maybe the most important thing is the selection and seating of jurors. One thing that's extraordinary, I think, about this was that half what we call the jury pool, right? Half the people who were pulled in initially said they could not be unbiased about Donald Trump. Now, that is an incredibly high figure. Half the jury pool says, I just can't be unbiased about the defendant. Uh, so that's one thing that, but yeah, the most important point about, point about the jury is regardless of what you might think or feel or hear about the defendant, you have to be completely unbiased 
when you make a judgment on the evidence. Uh, I don't know whether these 12 jurors and the alternates are going to be able to do that. You know, the, that's the process of voir dire is supposed to be able to smoke out people who really are biased. But I don't know. I, I will put it, despite all its defects, uh, I would rather be put on trial for something in the United States with a jury than any country in Europe or Asia without a jury. That's the alternative. And so even though it has a lot of problems, ultimately I have faith in the reasonableness of randomly selected Americans to make a judgment about whether something like should go to jail for, the, you know, for a long time than some unelected uh, you know, administrator bureaucrat in Brussels or Paris or you know, Berlin or somewhere where you know, they don't have criminal juries. So, sure. Hi, I'm Abraham, Professor Dude. thank you for coming. Um, I'm a senior studying political science. Um, since we're on the topic of juries, I had a quick question regarding peremptory strikes. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a, a benefit to peremptory strikes, or should either the defense or prosecution provide reasons for why they're mm -hmm. um, striking jurors from the pool? So, uh, you know, for those of you not destined for law school, <laughs> peremptory strikes are when we go through this process of voir dire, we're looking at each individual, seeing whether they're unbiased or not, or right? each side and the judge asks them a variety of questions to see. And uh, I hate to, you know, you've probably seen all these movies like uh, Runaway Jury and things like where people say, oh, there's a science to picking jurors. But when I've seen this happen, I mean, I think they, they ask the most ridiculous biased questions like, uh, you know, do you have any relatives in law enforcement? Oh, so then the assumption is, oh, that person is going to side with the prosecution. Or do you have any relatives that have ever been in jail? Oh, that person's automatic. Right? The, I think I find like the psychological ideas behind a lot of our dear questions to be so primitive. Uh, you know. But anyway, so uh, after you go through that whole process and you've asked people questions, the peremptory strike refers to the right of the prosecution and the defense counsel to say, I just want that juror off. You don't have to give a reason. You can give reasons, but then they don't count as peremptory strikes. You can just say, that person's biased. Then they go. And then each side gets a certain number of peremptories, which means I don't have to give a reason. I just don't like that person. I want them off the jury. So uh, yeah, you could say, there are people who have said it would be better for our system if there were no peremptory strikes. All that we should have is the court looking for unbiased jurors, and then right, the government and the defense counsel shouldn't be able to indulge their stereotypes when they try to keep people off the jury. Um, but we've had them in our system for basically forever, I think. And so uh, my basic attitude is if you, it shouldn't make things worse, right? Uh, theoretically, maybe it should lead to a less biased jury, even having peremptories. And I always worry about getting rid of something <laughs> that we've had in a long time by tradition and practice because we don't know the unforeseen consequences. You know, you pull one string, you don't know what else you're gonna unravel. So I would get, now the one the one area we have limited peremptory strikes as a system is uh, it used to be okay to use them to strike people because of their race. So like if you were uh, a prosecutor or defense counsel, you used to be able to strike everyone of a certain race using your peremptory strikes, and there was nothing you could do. The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. So you can use on per, your peremptory strikes to try to get it biased, but you can't use it to carry out discrimination. By the way, the one lesson from voir dire is if you don't want to serve on a jury, now you know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> right? I am biased against the defendant. <laughs> There's nothing you can say that will make me unbiased. Right? And you will get off and get to go back to work. Right. Yeah. Hey, Professor, thanks for coming uh, to America, to the United States. <laughs> interesting um, customs you have here. I'm not, <laughs> the, I'm not this going money, to law This money thing is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to law school because I've been to law school. Oh. Um, undergrad in Notre Dame Law School here. Oh, great. Uh, practice in Washington, D.C. My condolences. I, I'm, I'm, I, I understand. <laughs> I'm from the swamp. Um, I have a couple comments and then a question. Yep. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that the Trump trials have brought into bold relief is for the American population is how outcome determinative a case can be depending on the judge you get. Yes. I mean, if you look at the judges that the one that handled the $454 million judgment Judge against him. Mm -hmm. Angeron, sorry. Angeron. You're looking at Marchand or whatever his name is in yeah, New York handling the jury trial now. In D.C., the federal district court judge, it's, 
And we have Allison Con uh, Cannon in, in Florida. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, you know, I think people will begin to understand what litigators have known for a long time, that what judge you get really can make a difference to the outcome of a case. I mean, a huge difference, maybe even more than the jury. Um, in that regard, and, and oh, by the way, how much reliant you are on your appellate rights mm -hmm. and how, how the appellate courts can correct, including the Supreme Court. Why is it, given how infirm the, we all, a lot of us think that the case before Judge Merchan is in New York, how infirm that case is that you first mm -hmm. described, mm -hmm. why is it that that case is going to trial? Are you, are you aware of whether the dispositive arguments that are mainly legal, as you pointed out, no, no real federal yeah. uh, crime here, not one that can be prosecutable by the state or the uh, county judge or county prosecutor, uh, how is it those have gotten by this judge? That's that the, now the case is going into the hands of a jury, which, you know, is from I'd New York. I, I think you, I, I agree with your point and your question. I think people tend not, people may tend to underestimate how powerful the trial judge is. As you say, the trial, and we're seeing it on display in real time, a trial judge, I mean, we often say, right, the trial judge is the king or queen of the courtroom. They have absolute almost authority on what goes on in that room, and you're starting to see it, right? Don't criticize the witnesses or you get a thousand dollar fine and I might send you to jail. The, the judge's power is incredible right, inside, the, inside the courtroom. Uh, and one thing you point out, here's one place where a judge's discretion makes a big difference. If you were a judge and you knew there's a legal time bomb in the case, like in Judge Merchon's case about uh, the hush money payments with this constitutional problem embedded in it. You could stop the trial entirely and say, I'm not gonna have any proceedings until this issue gets resolved and send it up to the highest court in New York State, or right. ultimately the US Supreme Court. You might think, and I might think, that would be the sensible thing to do, because if you decide that issue, that could obviate the whole case, right? The case would be unnecessary. But a trial judge can also say, let's see if Trump gets acquitted. If he gets acquitted, then we don't need to bother with this at all. And so we'll leave the legal issues till later. That is, as you know, completely within the discretion of the trial judge. It's almost impossible to force the trial to stop and send worthy legal issues on appeal, even if those legal issues you knew were going to be 100% on your side once yep. they got up on appeal. That just shows, as your, your point is excellent, that really shows you the power of trial judges. Even though, you know, in school, law schools, colleges, we tend to read and think about only about Supreme Court justices maybe these appellate judges in between, but we sometimes neglect how important and powerful these trial judges are. And that, I agree with you, it's a great example. And it doesn't look like this judge was randomly assigned. Now that I don't know about. So he, he had previous cases involving Two Trump, or three so, of them. Yeah, so once you, I think in New York, I think like the federal system, if you have a certain case that's assigned to you and then following new ones have the same rough subject and parties, they get assigned to you too. Yeah. I don't know if that's what New York did. One either. quick question. Mm -hmm. on, on the federal, uh, with Jack Smith, the federal cases, I, I know there have been some amicus briefs that were filed in the appellate and maybe Supreme Court level that challenged whether Jack Smith has the authority, which he was pro whether he was properly appointed mm -hmm. as whatever they're called these days, special counsel. Special counsel, yeah. Are you following that, arg that at all? And is yeah, it yeah. still alive be before the Supreme Court? I don't think it's been decided, but that one intrigued me. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll describe quickly is, uh, so there are two kinds of special counsel. There are the kind that were created in the wake of Watergate, and they were called independent counsels. They were actually created by statute. Uh, those were the ones that led to Justice Scalia's famous dissent in Morrison versus Olson. Uh, those were the ones that created the special counsel uh, office of Ken Starr, investigating Clinton or the, uh, arms for hostages uh, prosecutor who uh, investigated the Reagan and Bush administrations. So that prosecutor is over and done with. The law that created that counsel who had almost complete independence was uh, 
uh, sunsetted in 2000. The Congress didn't pass a law, reenact the law. So the special counsels we're seeing now, like Jack Smith, are just appointed according to the Attorney General, according to Justice Department regulations, where the Attorney General says, I promise I won't interfere with this special counsel. But they have no real independence of the kind that used to exist before. For example, in the previous one, the president could not fire the independent counsel. The president can fire this one. The president and the attorney general cannot order the previous one what to do. Uh, the president and the attorney general can give orders to this special counsel. So uh, the claim here is that this special counsel is so powerful, they have to go through presidential appointment. Uh, they're not just an employee. They are actually an, uh, an officer. They're like a, uh, the kind, not quite like, but similar to the kind that have to get Senate advice and consent. They are what we call principal officers of the government and not what we call inferior officers or employees. Um, so uh, I, don't have, I don't have a great prediction, but I don't think that's going to win because that same claim was made against Robert Mueller. Uh, who did the special counsel investigation of President Trump, and that went to the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court denied it. So I would guess the Supreme Court is probably not going to uh, change its mind on that one. But that's an important, as a matter of constitutional structure, it's actually an important issue, but I don't think the Supreme Court really wants to delve into it right now. Yeah. Let me get a, a, a <clears throat> couple questions in here before we conclude. Um, you didn't uh, address or bring up uh, the basic question, is Trump going to get convicted in <laughs> any of these cases? I don't see that ma primarily as a matter of law. Mm -hmm. um, what's, your, what's your prediction? So you know what Yogi Berra said. <laughs> <laughs> Predictions are really hard, especially about the future. <laughs> right? So uh, if I had to guess, if I was, just, if I was betting, I would... would uh, Phil didn't tell you, I love to gamble, <laughs> especially craps. Craps is my game. Blackjacks, that's just for, yeah, that's so boring. So anyway, if, you were, if I had to bet money, I would bet that there will be at least one juror on the Trump jury who's going to refuse to convict. All he needs is one out of 12. So I was trying to figure out the probabilities in a city where, and now I'm not sure this is the case, that you can use the voting percentages for Trump in New York City as a proxy of, right, like just because 89% or 88% voted against Trump in 2020 doesn't mean to me 88% of the people who live in New York would vote to convict no matter what happened in the courtroom. So given that, I would say there's, all he needs is one person to say, I'm not persuaded. I will say this last time the Justice Department tried this kind of prosecution was against vice presidential candidate John Edwards. You might remember John Edwards tried to pay off his uh, girlfriend, it was weird, girlfriend slash campaign videographer, if you remember the facts. Uh, a strange combination. Um, and this is before TikTok. And anyway, so they tried to bring the prosecution and on the same theory, and one juror on that jury refused to convict. And the, pro and the Justice Department got the message and didn't try to bring these prosecutions ever again until now. So I would guess, one, so that doesn't mean he's acquitted or found guilty, that just means a trial is thrown out and has to be redone. But I think that happens, and I think the DA says, There's, I'm just not going to. I mean, this is a city that's got a tough crime problem, and they're spending millions of dollars on this prosecution. If he loses once, I don't think the DA is going to spend more millions of dollars on this case. Okay, lots, lots of people think that Trump getting indicted was fundamental to his comeback. Yeah. The I best agree. thing that happened to him politically was he got indicted. Uh, what about the trial itself? Mm. Uh, I think it's before, totally before the verdict, yeah. but the, will the trial yeah. help him or, or her? Yeah, I, I, so this is an amazing thing about what happened with the prosecutions is Trump, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but he did some kind of weird jujitsu and judo on the attack, which was he turned all these indictments into his winning formula for the primary, right? Because nobody would talk about anybody else but Trump in the primary. And he used it as, I'm being persecuted, right? Just like the government might persecute any of us. And I'm fighting for your rights. Right? And no one talked, does anyone remember DeSantis's education agenda? <laughs> right? I doubt anyone talked about it because we were talking about Trump all the time. 
So I think you're right that it had that. If the opinion polls suggest that's not the case uh, with the actual trials, that if he actually gets convicted of a felony, there's a certain percentage of people who currently support Trump in the polls who say they wouldn't vote for him. And when you have the margins as small as they are, it would take like 5% maybe of people to say, if he's convicted of a felony, I'm not going to support him now. But that's why Trump has unbelievable luck. Some, you pointed out the weakest case, the most frivolous of all these cases is the first case, this Bershon case. That's great for Trump, actually. If he were to win that case, it will delegitimize all the other cases coming afterwards. He's lucky to face Murchon first. His worst fear would have been to face the special counsel first on the January 6th trial, which is what they should have, the prosecutors should have done if they were thinking about this uh, seriously. Okay, you, so you anticipated my third question. Okay, uh, one last question. Let's say he's convicted. Uh, uh, you crap out. And so <laughs> you got to get it wrong, and he's convicted. Yeah. And then he wins the election. Ah, so that's interesting. So uh, there is a common misperception that you can't run for president or win the presidency from jail. Um, so <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> so the con there's actually a constitutional provision that says there's only three requirements to be president. Right? You have to be a certain age, you have to be a citizen born in the United States, and you have to have been a resident of a state for a certain number of years, 14, I think, years. But that's it. So you can't disqualify, except for the disqualification. So there's always this, if we, but he's not being prosecuted for insurrection. So even if he's prosecuted, he can't be disqualified under the 14th Amendment. So if he were to win, he would be president. So this is where it gets really interesting. Not if that wasn't interesting enough. <laughs> he can pardon himself for the federal crimes and get out of jail. He can't pardon himself of the state crimes. Right? So there would be an interesting conflict between the federal government and the state government, whether the federal government would willingly hand the president over to New York State for Rikers Island or to George, the state of Georgia for convictions. Right? If you're the president, what if you ordered the FBI to stop them? Right? What if you were a state and you tried to defy the federal order? The best thing would be, again, this is replacing legalism with common sense, would be to say, why don't you wait till the presidency is over and then go and face the music? I, that would have once upon a time been a reasonable solution. But when everyone's pressing their maximum legal positions, you're, you're Alvin Bragg or Fannie Willis, you might just say, I have a right to carry out the sentence right now. He can't pardon himself. Federal law is not an immunity for this. I want him now. All right. Uh, that is a good place to end our semester. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.